Road to the Draft with Cal Toomey and Matt Edwards. Hello and welcome to the Road to the Draft podcast brought to you by Host Plus. I am Riley Beveridge replacing Nat Edwards who is still on maternity leave and we are joined as always by our draft guru here at afl.com.au, Cal Toomey. Cal, how are you going? Good, thanks, Riles. Four weeks to the draft. Today, exactly. Today and then uh, obviously tomorrow it's four weeks to the second round of the draft. (laughs) But uh, looking forward to it and it's a big couple of weeks coming up as we try and work out who's going where and... I think clubs are still trying to work it out. I've been on the phones the last week or so and haven't picked up a whole lot, but hopefully our <laughs> guest today might be able to help us out with a little bit of uh, knowledge right at the top of the pool. Will be a big few weeks for this man, Melbourne recruiting manager Jason Taylor. Jason, thanks for joining us today. It must thanks be having me. a pretty big period for you heading into the last four weeks. I can imagine this is your busiest time of the year. Yeah, so we just come off the back of a two-day conference. Um, the full-time recruiting staff and also Simon and Alan Richardson and Matty Egan and Josh Marnie, of course, and uh, went through some certain scenarios. And uh, what what goes on in those um, in those sort of couple of days? And talk us through what that conference means from your perspective. Are you putting up your final board? Are you showing the the coaches you know who you're really interested in and and keen on? What's talk us through those 24, 48 hours? Yeah, pretty much. I think it's a slightly different landscape um, that we're in now, starting off of last year with the trading of of picks so you've got to um i suppose prepare for all different scenarios because we can trade picks clearly uh till a week out and also on the night so um we're having conversations and tim lamb's having conversations with other list managers um ongoing about certain scenarios that may play out so you know effectively at the moment our our last pick's 97 so we're working towards that we're we realise that'll come in yep. um, significantly, but we need to prepare for that. And that may be 75 players that we need on our list, but clearly having two early selections, you know, we work through that process with the coaches. Um, and, you know, you try and canvas their opinion. They're really experienced footy men and, um, you know, where the list sits and, you know, the list needs come into it, you know, typically early in the draft, best available is always really critical, but... Also, when there's um, highly talented players that are specific roles that you might need to fill, that, that's a conversation you've got to have as well. Obviously, it was a busy trade period for you. You've brought in Ed Langdon and, and Adam Tomlinson, two players that uh, will add a lot of run to your outside game. Just on Ed, you've liked him for a while. What What, what is that, that that wanted you to bring him to the club over the summer? Yeah, we have. Um, well, just his running ability, and it's it's an area of the ground that we need to address, and same with Adam. Um but Ed, Ed, yeah, we liked him when he was younger. He's, he's just got good speed, good endurance, but also he's pretty smart with his running patterns. Um, and, you know, he's starting to build a, a really good uh, career at the moment and we're, we're up to have him. And certainly, it, as I said at the start, it's an area that we just need to address. And on Adam Tomlinson as well, a, a bit of a twofold question. I guess, what did you like about him and where do you expect him to play? Because he's, he's been someone that's played forward, he's played through the midfield at the Giants and he's he's also, I think he started his career relatively early in, in defence. What do you like about him and where do you see him playing at the days in 2020? Yeah, on the wing, I think that uh, we really want to try and settle him there. Um, and He's played some really good football there for GWS. Um, we can see him helping us there. I mean, he does give you some flexibility with his aerial and his height, um, but predominantly we look to play him on the wing. I'm keen. I'm sure you guys are keen to move on from 2019 in many ways. You know, the season wasn't how you guys would have hoped it would pan out. But how important was it to bring in some new faces during the trade period to, you know, freshen up that list? Yeah, I think it's it's important not just on field but off field. And then you know, Josh Marnie's done a really extensive review of the football department and what went wrong this year. And um, you know, a lot of people. Um, have had to, I suppose, put up their hand and take ownership that things weren't quite right and we didn't get a lot of things right this year and there has been some change and unfortunately that happens when when you have a season like we have. But we've uh, made those changes now, both on and off field, and uh, you put a full stop on it and you, you get moving forward and um, we're really excited by what, what lays ahead. Now, for these fans who are listening, we will soon get to Jace's thoughts on the top prospects and, and pick three and what might be in store there. Keen to look at the big deal, though, which was really interesting from my perspective and from everyone's perspective, um, the, the pick swap with North Melbourne. Can you talk us through how that one came about and what was the reasoning behind that one during the trade period? Yeah, I think that, you know, if you've got an opportunity to get in right now, yep. um, I'm always excited by that. Um like we just spoke about, you know, you, you don't expect to have the year we had um, off the back of 2018, but we did. And 
that provides us with an early selection. Um, and we thought it might be a good opportunity to get in and get another early selection. Um, we looked at next year's draft and whilst um, I think all drafts are, are good, um, it is compromised to some extent, I think, yeah. next year. And I think the work we've done in the futures market, Todd Patterson done some work in that area for us that, um, you know, it's roughly around 30% of the top 30 are, um, are, are tied to someone else. So yep. we think that because it's compromised, it might have been a good opportunity and we like the player in the, in the range um, for this year. So it's as simple as that. We're not targeting a specific player. It's uh, just getting another early draft selection, get them in together, get them a year earlier and get going. So you don't move up with a player in mind? No. No, no. I don't think you can because they quite clearly could go. Or yep. and, and like I said earlier, you know, we're still having conversations with clubs where things could move and um, they're, they're pretty active, those conversations at the moment between a lot of clubs. When these pick swaps take place, I know a lot of journos rush to do the, the points index, the draft value <laughs> index, and, and see how the points weigh out and which club won the deal based on that. As a recruiter, how much do you look at that and how much weight do you put into the, the DVI, the draft value index? Do you, do you look at it at all as a guide or do you, does it, do you trust your gut in that sense? Yeah, certainly both, but you do have to look at it as a guide because if you're, you're doing a deal with someone else, so it, it needs to be advantageous to both parties. And certainly um, with academy father-son prospects, particularly academy prospects, there needs to be, you know, um, an attraction for a club you're dealing with if they've got a player in mind that they may take, e.g. a Tom Green or a Liam Henry thing. How much interest did you guys get for pick three during the, the trade period? And I imagine that's still ongoing at the moment, but obviously it was up for grabs if the right deal came about. Yeah, well, uh, we, we had some interest in it for sure. It's a unique situation given the... Um, what we assume the Gold Coast situation, yeah, um, if Rail and Anderson, yeah, um, so um, it becomes the first live pick, so it's almost like pick one. So <laughs> there's been a few people come for it, and also, um, you know, it's unique again because of the academy prospects yeah. that are involved. How how do you view this year's draft crop? I mean, obviously you said there before that it's almost essentially pick one, given what's going on with Rail and Anderson, the top end in particular. How do you view that? Yeah, no, I think it's a pretty good draft. So I'm like, quite excited by it. And even sitting down with the coaches and uh, Josh Josh in the last few days is that, um, you know, going through players' visions, their strengths and weaknesses, a bit about their backgrounds and um, their potential to improve. And, and they're quite excited by, you know, the 20 or 30 players we went through with them. Um, so, you yeah, know, I think it's, it's, it's a good, solid group. How many... Do you tap out at some point? Is there a point on your list and the board that you've looked at the last couple of days where you say there's a group of 35 that I'm really confident on and then another group of 20 that I'm not as sure but they've got some talent and another 20 who are, are a bit, you know, got a mark against their name? What's, how do you sort of rank them like that? You weren't hiding in a room somewhere. <laughs> no. Is it a bit like that? <laughs> no, it's a bit like that, mate. Yeah, uh... <laughs> Colour-coded? <or? laughs> no, we got to... I'd love uh, to be in that room. Second... You know too much already. You're welcome to invite me in sometimes. <laughs> The second um, day was uh, more looking beyond 30. Yep. Um, so, yeah, the, I mean, and that's a consideration if you're looking to trade back in to get in around that mark as well. But, look, I think that you're right. There's a, a solid group there where you think I'm, I'm really confident with that group up to 35, for example, roughly. Um, but that's when, you you know, you've got to really do your work and, um, I suppose be positive in, in a lot of ways with certain players' strengths and that's where their character comes into play, whether they can maximise those strengths. And um, But there is a group then from there on about 30 where, geez, they've got some high-end stuff, but there's also some flaws in their game and, and that's probably right through to the top as well, mate. Do you know how many picks you're going to be using at the National Draft yet? Yeah, it'll be three to four. Three yeah, to four. Yeah, yeah. yeah still working through. Let's go with pick three then. How many players are in the mix right now for that selection? Well, it's probably... Um, Got it down to about three players, I reckon, Kel. It's, yep. uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you who's who's in front but um, at the moment. But, um, yeah, obviously there's a bit to think about and there's variables in different types that, that are an attraction to us. Is Luke Jackson in that mix? Yeah, he'd be in that mix, I'd say. Um, you know, we've done a fair bit of work on Luke, um, you know, particularly latter part of the year um, where he, he was able to go forward. So I was fortunate enough to go and see him live play forward a little bit more. So he does have some flexibility in his game. I don't, we don't really purely see him as a ruckman only, but um, he still was able to have some mid-20 possession games playing ruck and forward. 
and hit the scoreboard. So um, yeah, he's a, he's a unique player in that sense. But yeah. obviously, there's there's other players that have got some high end qualities in their game. So. Do you think he plays as a ruckman next year, or would, would he come into if it's Melbourne or if it's another club? As would he come in and start as a forward? Do you think in your mind? Yeah, I think you, you know, as I said, he, he's a little bit unique. So he has played one or two quarters as a genuine midfielder as well in a trial game. Yeah. Um, but I, I would like to think that if you brought him in, you might get him going in the forward groups and get that really improving. Um, he's got. It's effectively, I think he's played about twenty five games at. At, um, in the last three years, and they've all been done at, I suppose, the elite junior level, if you like. Yep. Um, so he's learning on the job in amongst his the be- better of his peers. Um, yeah, get him there and just tick his ruck work along, potentially. I was going to say, I mean, how much have you seen his growth you know, develop and you know, improve over the past 12 months? And, I mean, he made the decision in the middle of last year to focus purely on footy after what was an extremely promising basketball career. Mm. Um, have, have you seen him grow over 12 months? Yeah. Because he's unique because of the basketball background and, and uh, it's significant. Yep. Um, but, you know, the other guys who are in the mix for that picker, if you go back over their bottom age stuff, um, you're seeing flashes um, and the way they've been able to build their games this year and be more consistent, it's significant as well. Do you know what I mean? But yep. I, I, I think he's um, – I think everyone who watches footy and uh, is in my line of work would agree that um, – even post nationals, his games come together a lot more. Yep. Would Hayden Young be in that mix as well? He's he's someone that's sort of long been thought to be in that sort of top three to five bracket. Is he someone in the mix for that spot? Yeah, definitely. And 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 he he comes under the same bracket as Luke as, as um, someone who, if you go back over his bottom age, there was flashes. If you really drill down on it, like he had a fair bit to improve, and he's certainly been able to do that, and he plays well at um, the top level. Um, obviously, excellent decision maker and execution. You mentioned before about what team needs versus you know best available talent with those early picks. But how much, if you had to weigh up a percentage, when you're looking at this this big pick, you know, pick three is a massive pick in, in any club's eyes, how much are you thinking about what we need right now versus just the best player? And what would suit our team for next year? You know, yeah, versus, a, bit of, yeah. a bit of everything, but at the end of the day, when you're picking a pick three, you're picking the player that you think is going to be the best AFL player yep. long term. So. Um, you do take all, all those factors come into your mind, but yeah, you're not you're not um, trying to outsmart yourself. Is there any lessons you've had early picks before? You had uh, two top ten picks in 2016, yeah. um, and also 2014. Um, is there any lessons you take just from a recruiting personal point of view from these early selections that you can use going forward? You know, with these really top end picks. Absolutely, mate. I think you learn off every pick. Yeah. Um, I take myself back to, you know, even home interviews or, you know, one-on-one interviews and little things that you think, you know, I wish I'd have asked that. Maybe yeah, found okay. that out a bit different. And, um, you know, we're always trying to um, get better in that area. Yep. Um, we think we do it do it well, but there's, you can always get better in your interview process and, and how you extract information. And um, so we're, we're always looking back on that with... You know, we've we've met with um, corporate companies this year and to see how they do their recruiting processes. Okay. And um, so you're always kind of trying to look outside the square and f- just find a little edge. But, um, you know, you do you do look back, you do learn. Um, you know, they they take time to mature players. Yep. They come in as 18-year-old boys and, um, you know, they're going to learn on the, in a pretty harsh environment and um, they get challenged. So you want to make sure that they're, they're up for the... That challenge. With those two top ten picks you've got, three and eight at the moment, how much does three shape what you do at eight? Yeah, not necessarily. Um, but I can see a line through that question that you, you could say when I spoke earlier about whether you're potentially looking at a need. Um, so maybe that might have a, a point of difference for, for what you might do with that second selection. Would, would there be a consideration for, for Tom Green at three? I mean, he's a player... I suppose with academy players, there's always been a bit of apprehension in how early you bid on them and where you bid on them. From your perspective, would he be a player you'd consider there? Yeah, no, we've always been, and since I started in the role, like we, we bid on Isaac Heaney, mm. um, and that was at pick two, I think. Yep. Millsy and at Keller three. Mills, yeah. yeah, so uh, we don't do that to be smart. We actually rated those players, and um, so 
that's what I'm charged with and, and our department's charged with, so we need to be true to that process. And he's certainly in that mix, there's no doubt about that. Like, he's, his footy speaks for itself and, and he's, um, his character's high end. He's got leadership and um, he's just going to be a fantastic player. GWS are obviously keen on moving up the board too. I think they approached you guys during the trade period. Do you think right now that you'd keep the, the pick three and go into the draft? As it stands here today, we, we have, yep, yeah, absolutely. And will those, I mean, how much do you have to think about what they would take if they moved up versus if you move back and if you might be looking or interested in the same player? Is that a discussion that was had in the past couple of days when you guys are looking at sort of the tactical sense of this draft? Yeah, I think so. I think that if the, <laughs> if you had a conversation <laughs> and they said, oh, we're not picking that play, well, you might look at yeah. it a, a, a little bit closer. But at the end of the day too, Cal, you, um, you just need to be careful and, you know, a lot of work goes into this decision and... Um, if there's a 0.5% risk factor in something like that, you don't do it. Pick eight, just a couple of names who might be in the mix there. Lockie Ash who's another one who we think somewhere fits in the top 10. Caleb Sarong potentially. Are those guys on the radar for, for those selections as well? Absolutely. There's a lot of good players still there at pick eight. And, um, you know, there's Brody Kemp, you know, who really, he's, he, uh, the ACL unfortunately, but he was really tracking... Upwards, um, and I think even Darren Frew just said he was a, at the game when he did it, you know, when yep. um, he started that game pretty well. So, you know, he showed his real flexibility um, in the Nationals. That was probably his best period of footy for the year. Um, so it's a little bit of an unknown of where it went to from there, but um, it's, a, it's a good sample size. But, yeah, there's many others that we're looking at around that pick, to be, to be honest. Like, um, it's what falls out. You know, inside there, and um, you know, Devin Robinson, he's a uh, Lark medalist, yep. um, played under duress, plays like a real warrior. Um, you know, he's got some air of his game, he, he needs to clean up, but um, the way he goes at his footy, you'd think that he can improve. Josh Marnie said during the trade period as well that you guys would be kind of use the draft to pick up a small forward after missing out on Jamie Elliott. There's a player who plays a little bit like Jamie Elliott and Cody Waitman. Is he someone who you consider? Yeah, I think that Co- I think it's one of those years where. You know, I've, we've we've had discussions in the past that um, they don't come around all that often. I reckon really good small forwards like Jamie Elliott. You talk of, um, you know, at the moment Charlie Cameron and uh, you know Silva Rioli when I back when I first started. Really, <laughs> um, I might be missing someone in between, but probably the most prolific, um, best performed small forwards. Of the modern era, if you like, say Eddie Betts, who was overlooked and went in the preseason, mm. and Stephen Milne picked twenty three in the rookie draft. Mm. You know, both five hundred goal goal kickers. So, you know, there's a school of thought: do you go early on a small player? But um, when they're producing that, and I think it gets overlooked their importance to the game. So, yeah, there's a, there's there's really two or three or four pretty good small forwards in this year's pool. And you, um, and you have a, a, an affinity too to Jamie Elliott. You might have been part of the team that picked him yeah. up. Yeah. So, well, you were, <laughs> not might, were. Yep. If if you did your top 10 now, which you're doing at the moment, how many players would it be different to your top 10 at the start of the year? I'm just interested. You know, obviously don't know. You well, I did know, read that question you gave me, Cal, uh, in the recent... Did you like that one? Yeah, like that one. Uh, <laughs> and I was just thinking about it on the drive. You know, at a guess, I didn't pull it out. I do have them kind of dated, but yeah. um, I would say it's about 50%. Okay. But they would still be in a, a range, that player. Yeah, but there, there's not a lot of surprises, I don't think. Okay. You've had three years now. Cal mentioned before 2015 was the last time when you had those two top 10 picks with Oliver and Wiedemann. You've had three years now of later selections. Yep. You've now got two top 10s again. Does that change the amount of time you put into these players and how much research you put into them, or is it all pretty similar? No, it's pretty similar, I think. It, it's um, because of you just don't know what's going to happen through the trade period. Mm. We don't know what's going to happen through... The next period of time, next month, yeah. yeah, correct, and then and then on the night. So you do need to prepare for all scenarios. Um, given the where we're at with our year, I did I do think that this year, um, to give you a greater insight, I did probably sit on certain players that you know for a three to four week period, which I okay. f- think was advantageous. I don't often do that. Like I, I can be quite broad, but yeah. I did. I did really go and sit on specific players for a period of time and 
Um, there was a couple of schools that I did see you at a few times throughout the year. Yeah, they yeah. weren't school games, Kel. <laughs> 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 um, Harley Bennell, the club, the club put out a statement about Bennell yesterday expressing their interest in him. Do you, do you have a gauge of that and how, how interested the club is? Yeah, no, certainly we've got an interest there, and um, but there's a, there's a pretty lengthy process that needs to... To uh, be taken and, um, you know, but uh, certainly he's a really good talent, as we know, Harley. And, um, yes, he's, he's faced some challenges um, over his career. And, and not, not only his off-field, which is, you know, he doesn't hide from, but also, you know, with his, his, his injury issues, which would have been really difficult. So he's had to show some resilience in that phase of his life. So... Um, it's it's all in front of him, but really, there's a long process to go through. As far as yep. you know, we've taken a, a bit of a step forward through that process, but um, come down to many other things. You're listening to the Road to the Draft podcast, brought to you by Host Plus. We're with Melbourne recruiting manager Jason Taylor. Don't forget that life never stops. Wherever you go, Host Plus is the top performing industry super fund that goes with you, the fund that moves you with you forward and moves you forward. Host Plus, we go with you. Bet you didn't have we didn't have a sponsor last time you were in the, on the show, so that's pretty big news, isn't it? It's a good get. Yeah, I've brought yeah. that in with me. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Since Riley's been here the past two weeks, we've had a host plus with us, and they're well, I was, great. I was wondering what he was doing. There. <laughs> <laughs> so was I. That was, that was a strange lead into a question, wasn't it? <laughs> just, just got a generic one just on the list in general. Um, obviously, a prelim final in 2018 and then a second second last finish in 2019. It's opposite ends of the spectrum. Just in terms of the list, where do you see it? Uh, do you find a middle ground there, or where do you see the list going into 2020? No, look, I think that, um, look, no one at the footy club is going to sit there and make excuses. Certain things didn't go our way and didn't go right and there was mistakes made and and, um, and everyone owns that. Um, so I, I'm looking at the list, how it was tracking at 2018, yeah. um, you know, and I look forward to seeing a really good pre-season and I know the players are smarting, as we all are. Um, I think, you know, Simon's on record saying he felt sick in the guts. Well, I think we all did. And, mm. um, so, yeah, but the proof will be in the pudding. And, um, you know, I, I'm still um, optimistic and excited about what we can produce going forward. Quick chat about some of the younger players who you've brought into the club over the past couple of years. I'm sure Melbourne fans would be interested in your take on their development. Uh, Tom Sparrow, two games in his debut year. How did you view his first season at Melbourne Footy Club? You know, Tommy was good. He... he he obviously showed that he can play AFL footy with the two games that he played, and um, he um, and unfortunately hurt his knee mid-year. But uh, he's tracking well at playing VFL footy with Casey, and um, you know playing mainly inside. Um, and I, I take my hat off to all that first-year group. Actually, they um, we, we we basically every week due to some of our injuries we had, they were leading leading the charge in the VFL a little mm. bit, obviously, with our, our listed uh, Casey players. But, um, you know, they really ground through the year really well. Now, Tom got the injury, and that was unfortunate. Aaron Nitschke got an injury before the year started, but he was really promising pre-season. Um, but, you know, James Jordan, um, Toby Bedford and Kay Chandler, they all um, improved, which is all you can see. And under that kind of duress of, you know, being a bit... Men down, I thought they could really hold their head up high. The one thing with that group, and Marty Hall as well, obviously came in yeah. and showed that he yeah. earned his chance and he can play AFL footy. But the one thing I will say with that group, and um, they won't die wondering, and, um, you know, they're, they're great, great young men and they'll they'll put their best foot forward. So I'm looking forward to what a second pre-season can do, and a full pre-season can do for that group. I was going to ask you about Marty Hall. How, how valuable, from a recruiting perspective, is his when you see a player play at VFL level and he does it. And I guess the second part of that question is, in your mind, in an ideal world, if there's a way to do it, would you like to see Caleb Sarong and Lockie Ash and these types of players get a chance at two or three weeks or is a month at the end of the year to play at, at sort of state level? Yeah, well, I did actually try and get a player to play at state level this year and okay. it didn't eventuate. So uh, there are occasions where you, you would like to see it. Um, so who, it is valuable. Who, who it is valuable, but um, <laughs> it is. Valuable. What were his initials? <laughs> <laughs> it is valuable because um, what you tend to find is, and it even plays on your listed players. And I remember casting my mind back to, um, you know, Nev, Nev Jetta and, and even Maxie Gorn. You know, when they're playing VFL footy, and you think that they're uh, 
they're playing well above the level and you could just know then that when they come in, they'll actually replicate that at AFL level. Yep. Um, and, and Marty was starting, he was doing that in his, you know, like he didn't put a foot wrong really and um, he started to do that uh, and look like an AFL player in his final year. So it gives you a lot more confidence. You've taken a couple of VFL players earlier in drafts over the last couple of years. Do you see the, the quality of VFL talent coming through in this year's national draft dropping away a little bit after the mid-season draft or is it still pretty high level? Uh, yeah, I think I think it's affected the pool okay. in general, yeah. So, but that's just stands to reason. I think that if you um, taking players out mid season, that, um, and then also the you know SSP, it, it's just going to dilute it. Yeah. Just, Cole yeah. Dunkley, we saw come into the club mid year. Charlie Spargo's done some good things as well. Uh, Bailey Fritch has been you know a sensation really since he took him at the KC program. Who are the players for the fans out there that you expect or are hoping to really sort of jump up another level in twenty twenty? Yeah, I think. Um, that group in particular, look, I think Bailey's been really good and Harrison Petty is one that, you know, I think that is going to be a really good long-term AFL player. Where he settles, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, Charlie Spargo, I think people forget, he, he had an excellent um, first year um, hmm. and didn't quite go to plan for, for the club last year. And... Charlie was part of that, and there'll be some learnings for him as well. But I'm I'm excited what he can get back to, and Harry and uh, and Bailey. But I'm also excited by uh, the new levels. You know, Clayton can go to, and and Petrarca and Brayshaw, and uh, and then and getting Lever and May playing together, and Neville even you know, and, and Hibo back to some of his better footy as well. So there's there's a lot of things I'm excited about. Um, but you know, we'll just see how it tracks, and obviously, hopefully, uh, pick. Pick three and eight, mate. And yeah, well, that's true as well. Did you see, by the way? So Christian Salem and Christian Petrarca are over at Nike HQ in Portland, I think. Portland, yeah. Portland. Yeah. Did you see who they caught up with last night? I didn't actually. Um, oh, I've forgotten his name. He's the marathon man, the bloke who broke the two two oh, hour marathon. Really? Yes. I've forgotten his name as well. Um, so I'm not. Sure. I'm Can't not. help you. <laughs> <laughs> it was a magnificent effort, anyway. But it it's, uh, I think it shows though. Uh, Two Christians are attacking their preseason pretty strongly, and and are keen for you know a big improvement on on expect well, big two kilometer time trials. <laughs> <as well. laughs> I'm not sure Christians breaking the two kilometer time or the two hour uh, two hour marathon, but yeah. I think he's pretty keen, and you can see. I actually thought his season last year was probably a little bit underrated, probably yeah. fell by the wayside a little bit given the side played so poorly most of the year. No, I'd agree with that, and and I think there's you know you can see. Um, the the boys are you know they're in they're in the club a fair bit and you know they they're on their toes and as they should be um, yeah but, and Kyle I'm not sure what answered around Kyle no no yeah. Kyle came in and handled himself really well but he he he's the same as that group that he formed with you know that first year group that um, yeah I can see some good things for that group because I reckon they'll just they just work hard. I'm, I'm glad you picked Cole because I was out at his house. And I was just hoping someone picked him that <laughs> night. So I was very glad that he got selected. <laughs> um, Cal mentioned the United States before. Obviously, they're probably leading the way in terms of advanced analytics coming into their recruiting departments. How how much into that sort of bubble are the demons going forward into that sort of analytics department? Yeah, no, we certainly are. And uh, I think that you just need to. And, um, you know, we've just recently employed someone who hasn't started yet from uh, Port Adelaide. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so... Um, yeah, and he'll he'll have a broad role across the club, but um, certainly it's um, an area that we focus on, and we know that um, clubs are putting a lot of time into it now. And um, I think it's just about anything that can provoke thought yeah. um, is a good thing, and um, then you just got to get the balance right between experience and um, and and what what the the numbers are telling you. Do you think there's an obvious area that the recruiting industry and the scouting world can improve in the AFL? Is there something that as an industry, you'd like to see done better or differently or, or shaped in a different way? Yeah, I, I like the new academy, okay. the hubs. Um, I think that um, there's some challenges for clubs with, you know, the academies as far as you seem to be compromised in a lot of ways in more than one facet of it. Um, which can be quite frustrating. We're and, talking um, NGA and, and yeah, Northern Academies. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And I understand the the, the uh, merit of it and the process of it, but I think it could be uh, scrutinised uh, 
more strongly as far as w eligibility. And I understand now there's a bank of a few years so that things can settle down a little bit. And But, you know, I don't know whether players, and if they're a clear top 30 or let's call it the first round, second round, 36, that yep. is there, are they independently judged and they're, they're in the open market? But then I also understand that, you know, Clubs will say, "Well, he wouldn't have been that player if we didn't put the amount of time into it." So it's it's a real, it's a real um, arm wrestle that one. I reckon about the draft age, eighteen, right? Yes, no. I think you asked me this both times I've been on. <laughs> <laughs> so I better be careful. I'm not sure. What, well, I what did you say last time? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, I'd stick with eighteen, mate. I, I think um, I can understand. Um, reasons behind both, but I, I think that you know there's a lot of people would already go at 18, and, and you don't want to hold them back. Before we let you go, a couple more. Uh, Riley wrote an interesting story this week about Cody Hurst and just him being a test case for the mid-season draft that isn't the fairy tale story. Um, yeah. Do you think the rules are about right, or should they be sort of twisted a little bit to sort out or help those sort of players in those positions? Yeah, I think that's twofold as well. And and whilst you feel for for players in that situation. Um, you know, Cody, I suppose he's moved and uh, Josh DeLuca's moved yes. as well. And, yep. um, but, you know, I, I'm not sure why. Do you know what I mean? So where I'm going with that is, is if you say, if we all of a sudden you say, well, let's bring it in, it's got to be an 18th month contract. Well, then, you know, there might be reasons why that player failed. Now, I'm not saying that about those two boys for yep. one second, but you've got to be careful. So um, it probably needs further thought. Um, and not only from an industry's perspective, but also from a, um, a, a player's perspective as well. So they might choose not to. Yeah. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I think because it was such a new um, concept and that was thrust upon us pretty quickly that, you know, you're doing your work for it. And it did throw up extra workload as far as for the yeah, clubs. I can because imagine, you, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think every um, stakeholder needs to have a bit more of a think about that one. Are you, are you a fan of adding, bringing in more sort of trade and draft periods? They've brought in, obviously, the mid-season draft. There was talk about a pre-season trade period. Are you a fan of bringing in more player movement periods? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm a little bit um, I don't, I'll, old school in that sense yeah. as far as get your list in shape and that's the challenge of the competition, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, but I understand the moving parts as well, so I get that, but... How many is too many um, to really, you know, justify yeah. all those moving parts in a sense? You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I haven't sat down and really gone through it with a fine-tooth comb, but it's, um, I'm not against the um, mid-season. Yeah. I'm not sure there needs to be another one. Yeah, it's interesting because it, Cal Burns, Gold Coast recruiting manager last week, said that he didn't think there'd ever be – a final settled thing. He said it would constantly evolve. There'd constantly be new things taken and withdrawn. It seems like in the States, which the AFL tries to copy a lot, it is settled now and they, they haven't introduced anything new to it. For There's little, been slight tweaks, but hasn't been an, an overhaul for, for a decade now. I, I wonder if we are trying to tinker with it just a bit too much. I dare you to ask that question to Gil McLaughlin when he's on the show in about a month. I'll do that. No, I, th I don't disagree with that in a sense and that's where I'm going, I suppose, yeah. in a roundabout way is that... Um, yeah, because uh, change is part of life and change needs to be, you know, you need to keep searching to evolve and get better. Mm. But uh, the world has a funny habit of turning full circle <laughs> and saying, geez, that was a good idea. Yeah, no, it was a pretty good idea in 1920. Well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was a good idea getting you on the show because uh, we really appreciate the insights you've brought on today. As always, thanks for coming back. Um, and I think uh, Melbourne supporters will have enjoyed the last half an hour and your insights and good luck over the next three or four weeks and, and pick well, pick strong <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> and, and enjoy uh, the thrill of it all. We appreciate you coming on. No worries. Thanks, Cal. And thank Thanks, you, Cal. All. We'll have another guest next week. We do. We've got Stephen Wells next week. So all the big guns at the moment. Uh, we've had pick one and two last week, pick three and eight this week and Geelong have about 40 picks. So <laughs> <laughs> after moving Tim Kelly on, so lots to talk about with, uh, with Stephen next week as well. Cannot wait for that. And please join us next week on the Road to the Draft podcast.